Hi, everyone. Thanks for attending this presentation. I am an independent infection prevention consultant, and I'm hired by Metrix as their infection prevention advisor. Thanks for joining me today for navigating the high-level disinfection challenge in instrument reprocessing. I would like to thank Metrix for sponsoring this webinar. Today, we'll look at medical device reprocessing and disease transmission. We'll explore high-level disinfection, what it is, why it's important, and we'll look at why it's so challenging. At the end of this presentation, you'll receive all the slides, including resources and links to important standards and auditing tools. Now, reusable medical and dental devices are designed and labeled for multiple uses and are reprocessed by thorough cleaning, followed by high-level disinfection or sterilization between patients. These devices are made of materials that can withstand repeated reprocessing and the use of chemicals. Some examples are surgical instruments, such as clamps and forceps, scopes like endoscopes, bronchoscopes, duodenoscopes, and colonoscopes, and dental equipment like mirrors, amalgam condensers, and impression trays. Now, reuse of medical devices is a necessity. Reuse, costs, con reuse controls costs because facilities don't need an inventory of extra devices, but it also adds pressure to reprocess quickly. Now, who regulates these devices? The FDA Center for Medical Devices and the Center for Device and Radiological Health regulate the over 6,000 medical devices in the United States. Now, they require medical device manufacturers to provide written reprocessing instructions with a specific reprocessing regimen that is use-specific, clearly written, and comprehensive. And it tells the user how to thoroughly clean the device and the appropriate disinfection process. They also provide regulations regarding high-level disinfection and the sterilization of these over 6,000 devices. Now, disinfection isn't a one-size-fits-all event. It's a process that eliminates many or all pathogenic microorganisms except bacterial spores by physical or chemical means. There are three levels of disinfection. There's high-level disinfection, which kills all microbial organisms, including mycobacteria, but not necessarily large numbers of bacterial spores. Intermediate-level disinfection kills viruses, mycobacteria, fungi, and vegetative bacteria, but not necessarily bacterial spores. And low-level disinfection kills most vegetative bacteria, some viruses, and a few fungi, but not mycobacteria or bacterial spores. So how do we know which to use? Well, more than 30 years ago, Dr. Earl H. Spalding devised a method to determine disinfection and sterilization of patient care items and equipment, which we still use today. Spalding believed disinfection could be easily understood if items for patient care were categorized as critical, semi-critical, and non-critical, according to the degree of risk for infection involved in their use. Now, critical items enter or contact normally sterile tissue or the vascular system, and they require sterilization. Things like surgical instruments, certain catheters, implants, laparoscopes, and arthroscopes. Semi-critical items contact mucous membranes or non-intact skin. They minimally require high-level disinfection using chemical disinfectants unless sterilization is possible and it's in agreement with the manufacturer's instructions for use. So those would be things like endoscopes, laryngoscopes, cystoscopes, vaginal speculums, and ultrasound probes. Non-critical items contact intact skin, but not mucous membranes. They require low-level disinfection. Those would be things like bedpans, blood pressure cuffs, and stethoscopes. Now, device reprocessing is a multi-step process that involves cleaning, disinfecting, or sterilizing reusable medical devices. It's labor-intensive, time-consuming, and requires great attention to detail. According to the FDA, reprocessing generally involves three steps. And the first is at that point where the device was used, the point of use, where devices receive initial wiping and cleaning to remove debris like 
dried blood and tissue, and they then receive treatment to keep them moist. The second step is the transfer of that device to the reprocessing work area where it's thoroughly cleaned. And the third step is the device is either disinfected or sterilized, depending on the intended use of the device and what it's made of. Then it's either stored or it's routed back into use. Now, if the instructions for reprocessing are completely and correctly followed, reprocessing results in a device that can be safely used in more than one patient. Our focus today is on high-level disinfection. So this is the first of our poll questions. High-level disinfection is a process that eliminates all microorganisms from a device, true or false. Now the answer is false and I'll explain in the next slide. So high-level disinfection is a reprocessing process that uses disinfectants to eliminate most microorganisms on semi-critical medical devices and dental instruments, except for a small number of bacterial spores. Now some spores are allowed because semi-critical devices contact intact mucous membranes like the lungs or the GI tract, which are susceptible to bacteria, mycobacteria, and viruses, but are usually resistant to infection by bacterial spores. Why is high-level disinfection needed? Well, it's used for reprocessing semi-critical medical devices and dental instruments that are heat sensitive or incompatible with traditional sterilization methods. And where is HLD performed? ERs, ORs, OBGYN clinics, endoscopy, bronchoscopy, and GI clinics interventional radiology, central sterile processing, SPD, ambulatory and office-based surgery facilities, and decentralized locations throughout healthcare facilities. Here's a list of some of the most common high-level disinfectant chemistries. They're cleared by the FDA as dependable high-level disinfectants as long as the correct parameters for time and temperature are met. Now, most have good material compatibility and are effective. However, they all tend to cause some sort of irritation. Another poll question, which out of these choices would be the best choice for high-level disinfection of instruments? And the correct answer is D. OPA is the best choice here because it's highly effective against a broad spectrum of microorganisms, including bacteria, viruses, and mycobacteria. Now, this is a snip of a table of cleared FDA high-level disinfectants that can be used to reprocess heat-sensitive devices. This table was last updated in December of 2023. Now you can look up the product you're using or maybe products you're considering to make sure they're FDA approved. And it even details how to use a product in an automatic endoscope reprocessor. So if you're not familiar with this website, it's not a bad idea to take a look at it. Another poll question. All liquid disinfectants are capable of sterilization if their exposure time is increased, true or false? And the answer is false. Only certain high-level disinfectants can achieve sterilization with significantly extended contact time. And this is because most disinfectants are designed to kill only vegetative bacteria, and they aren't capable of killing those resistant spores, which is what's necessary to achieve sterilization. Now, to navigate the challenges in high-level disinfection, we should identify what they are. And one way to do this is to review findings from audits of the process. In 2022, the Joint Commission stated that performing intermediate and high-level disinfection was one of the top five requirements most frequently identified as not compliant. Now, non-compliance with HLD is typically higher than lower intermediate level disinfection because it's so much more time consuming. The Joint Commission found the most vulnerable locations for lapses in sterilization, or HLD, are ambulatory care sites, including those office-based surgery facilities and decentralized locations in hospitals. 
Infection control 020201 requires organizations to reduce the risk of infections associated with medical equipment, devices, and supply. And this standard applies to Joint Commission accredited hospitals, critical access hospitals, and ambulatory and office-based surgery facilities. Now, findings identified by the Joint Commission Office of Quality and Patient Safety from non-complying organizations include challenges with healthcare professionals who think HLD isn't important or they don't understand the distinction between low, intermediate, and high-level disinfection. They believe the risk of passing bloodborne pathogens or bacterial agents to patients is low or non-existent. They lack the knowledge or training required to properly HLD equipment, and they don't follow processes for HLD. They do things like take shortcuts, they don't follow the time frames, and they're not using HLD on semi-critical ultrasound probes. Now, the Joint Commission also found challenges with leadership, a lack of leadership oversight, a lack of a culture of safety that supports reporting of safety risks, HLD disinfection is seen as a low priority within the organization, and there's no dedicated staff to oversee proper HLD. Also, a lack of facility design or dedicated space to properly perform HLD. So staffing, training, facility design, IFUs, and leadership are several of the HLD challenges identified by the Joint Commission. Let's look at a few more findings from another survey organization, Cordemash and Associates. Now, the HLD process itself is a challenge due to the many opportunities where its multiple steps have more steps within those steps, multiple failures were observed by surveyors. In step one, point of use, surveyors observe failure to treat at the point of use prior to sending items to be reprocessed. They found instruments sent for reprocessing had visible blood and bio burden. They observed expired enzymatic products being used, and they found IFUs for those enzymatic sprays and cleaners used at that point of use weren't readily available. In step two, transport to that processing area, they observed not properly transporting devices for reprocessing, not using leak-proof, puncture-proof containers with lids labeled with biohazard stickers, used devices waiting to be picked up or delivered to SPD weren't stored in the soil utility room, and used devices were carried by hand in a towel, glove, or biohazard bag to the soiled utility room. In step three, Don PPE. At point of use, surveyors observed not using the proper PPE when cleaning and using enzymatic sprays, even though each product safety data sheet listed the recommended PPE that should be worn. In step four, decontamination, they observed not following IFUs, not using proper PPE, not visually inspecting all parts of devices for damage prior to decontamination, and also not removing those damaged devices from service and reporting them to leadership. They saw single brushes being used on multiple devices and not performing brushing underwater. Detergent IFU soak times were also not being timed. In step five, that rinse and dry, they observed not thoroughly rinsing and drying devices before manual HLD. In step six, those QC checks, they observed not performing QC checks on test strips and solutions, according to the IFUs, not keeping test strip containers closed or marked as open and their expiration dates, and not waiting the correct amount of time to read the test strip, and also not reading that color change properly. In step seven, high-level disinfect, they observed not measuring, mixing, and using the high level disinfectant chemicals according to product specific IFUs. They saw not fully submerging devices in that high level disinfectant for the IFU specified timeframe, not flushing internal ports, channels, or lumens. And they also saw air pockets and items floating in the disinfectant instead of being submerged. They observed staff adding additional items to the disinfectant 
once the soaking time had started. In step eight, that soak and rinse, they observed not removing items from the solution when the disinfecting time has been reached. And in step nine, documentation and storage, they saw not documenting cleaning and disinfection in the designated log and not storing devices in a way to prevent damage or keep them clean. So with so many steps within this HLD process and the challenge of knowing what, when, and how to do each step, it's no surprise surveyors have findings. Another poll question, pre-cleaning of medical devices isn't needed for high-level disinfection. True or false? The correct answer is false, and I'll explain that in the next slide. Because it's so important, we need to talk more about cleaning, another of the challenges of HLD and frankly sterilization too. Now many people think the cleaning process starts when medical devices are transported to the decontamination area, but in reality, device cleaning first begins at that point of use, then again in the decontamination area. Now don't confuse point of use cleaning with decontamination that takes place later in that reprocessing process. Point of use cleaning and treatment occurs either periodically during the procedure or immediately after using the device prior to being sent for further reprocessing. Point of use wiping, cleaning, and treating with enzymes per the IFU removes and prevents organic soil and debris from drying onto devices. It is a critical step in instrument reprocessing because it improves the efficiency and effectiveness of that meticulous decontamination that happens later on prior to HLD that helps prevent the formation of harmful microbial biofilms. And when biofilms develop, that HLD might not be successful. So even though instruments arrive in decontamination after being cleaned and treated point of use, are in pretty good shape, they still aren't ready to go straight to HLD or sterilization. Cleaning should occur again with meticulous attention to detail to those lumens and channels and hinges and cracks and crevices. If we get this step right, we have a better chance of providing a device that's safe for patient use. Cleaning is critical for minimizing contamination from that procedural area, that point of use, to its final destination for further reprocessing. It improves the effectiveness of the decontamination process by removing substances that can dry and make reprocessing more difficult and take longer. It helps prolong the, the life of instruments by reducing the contamination and preventing biofilm formation. Educating staff on, this, on the importance of cleaning and how to do it can help ensure that the steps are followed. So don't skip this very critical step because effective high-level disinfection depends on it. Now, another challenge is manual versus automated high-level disinfection. And high-level disinfection can be achieved with both. Now, manual HLD typically involves soaking a device in a solution at a specific temperature and concentration for a set amount of time. Manual HLD is still a popular option for some facilities, especially those that have low procedure volumes or budget constraints. However, manual HLD is performed manually by people, so it can be inconsistent and leave room for error. It can be difficult to ensure the correct temperature and time are reached and maintained. There are open systems that can expose staff to potentially harmful vapors from chemicals, and it doesn't provide the same quality assurance as automated methods. And studies have shown that manual cleaning can leave probes contaminated with visible soil that can be difficult to detect. Now, automated HLD is generally considered to be more efficient, consistent, and measurable than manual processes. It reduces the risk of staff exposure to chemicals and toxic fumes, and it standardizes important reprocessing steps. It also provides documentation of cycles, evidence that that device was properly disinfected, and it can also incorporate traceability. Now, the latest guidelines continue to recommend automated versus manual, 
for HLD whenever possible. But AERs aren't perfect. Of course, not following the AER manufacturer's instructions throughout the reprocessing process can lead to errors. And AERs have been linked to outbreaks of infections or colonization due to their water source because some AER water filtration systems might not be able to reliably provide sterile or bacteria-free rinse water. Now, sometimes the correct connectors are in place between the AER and the device, and this is critical to ensure complete flow of disinfectants and rinse water. There's also device design issues. Those can be a problem for AERs, um, like with duodenoscopes. The long, narrow channels and the recesses around the elevator area can be challenging to reprocess. And some duodenoscopes re require a flushing pressure that can't be achieved by most AERs, so they must be reprocessed manually. Now, research shows that 95% of patient-ready scopes retain residual liquid after automated reprocessing if they aren't dried properly before storage. So automation has some challenges too. Okay, another poll question. How often are test strips to test the minimum effective concentration, MEC, of a high-level disinfectant solution required? Weekly, daily, each time the solution will be used or only when manual soaking systems are used? And the correct answer is C, and we'll talk about that a little more. Adding to the already challenging HLD process is a lack of standardization among HLD products. High-level disinfectants have complex instructions, different expiration dates, open shelf life, maximum reuse period, soak time, and usage. There can be product issues with single-use HLDs that may not fully achieve their MEC and reusable HLDs that might fail before their maximum usage period. Some disinfectants have different test strips, different chemical exposure risks, and issues with material compatibility. Enzymatic detergents have different ratios of detergent to water, and there are many automated dispensing systems. Are they really accurate, and are we checking that accuracy? Some require certain water temperatures for efficacy. All must be precisely measured. All require specific and different soak times and none are disinfectants, so there's a risk to staff. What about soak times and usage? They also have multiple variables due to multiple chemistries and soaking requirements. How about those test strips? Current guidelines and IFUs recommend testing the MEC during each reprocessing cycle to ensure that the HLD concentration exceeds it. Each HLD requires a different test strip that has its own IFU and pass-fail conditions, manufacturer-defined shelf life, open container expiration date, and storage requirements. Keep the lid closed, maybe maintain a certain temperature, humidity, or light level. Many test strips also require QC checks on each newly opened bottle, which involves testing full strength and diluted disinfectant to ensure that the test strips provide correct readings. I have to state that the MEC test strip should be immersed in the HLD for a specified time and the color changes interpreted after a certain amount of time. So you'd better not walk away from that test strip during the wait time because you might miss that color change. Now, the instructions for using and testing high-level disinfectant products are complex and challenging. No wonder there are challenges, and human factors contribute to widespread non-adherence with guidelines. Another poll question. Almost all infections and patient exposures associated with reprocessing medical or surgical instruments involve high-level disinfection of reusable semi-critical instruments. And the answer is true, and that is according to researcher William A. Rotala. Modern healthcare uses many types of invasive devices and procedures to treat patients and help them get better. Unfortunately, infections are sometimes a result of this treatment caused by insertion of devices like catheters, ventilators, or having an invasive procedure. 
Each of these procedures involves contact by a medical device or a surgical instrument with a patient's sterile tissue or mucous membranes. A major risk from all these procedures is the introduction of pathogenic microbes from failure to properly disinfect or sterilize devices. Inadequate reprocessing can lead to device-associated infections, tissue irritation, and other adverse patient outcomes. Now, the actual number of infections that can be attributed to inadequate device reprocessing is unknown because it's not often investigated as a cause. Now, according to the most recent data from the CDC in the United States in 2010, there were over 51 million inpatient surgical procedures and an even larger number of invasive medical procedures like endoscopies. Failure to comply with scientifically based guidelines has led to numerous outbreaks and patient exposures, and you've all probably seen them in the news or heard about them. Due to this non-compliance, back in 2015, the CDC and the FDA issued a health advisory uh, about the need to properly maintain, clean, disinfect, and sterilize reusable medical devices. But we still have outbreaks and infections today. And speaking of outbreaks, in 2013, two dozen infections were reported in French and Dutch hospitals, prompting Olympus to alert European customers that one of its scopes could become contaminated due to a design flaw that was making it hard to clean. Now, outbreaks of infections at U.S. hospitals in L.A., Milwaukee, and Denver, and other cities followed over the next three years with an outbreak of carbapenem-resistant Enterobacterialis CRE at UCA Medical Center that killed two patients and potentially infected about 200 others. Now, Olympus knew about this faulty scope design back in 2012, but didn't disclose the problem until February of 2015, until that outbreak of CRE at UCLA. In total, at least 35 people at U.S. hospitals died since 2013 after acquiring infections from that contaminated Olympus scope. Cleaning is the most important step in reprocessing because what isn't cleaned can't be disinfected or sterilized. No wonder improper endoscope reprocessing has been identified as one of healthcare's most dangerous technology threats. Reprocessing endoscopes involves multiple steps, including pre-cleaning, cleaning, leak testing, disinfection, rinsing, drying, and proper storage that are specific to the brand of the device, so there's lots of variabilities in IFUs and products. So if you're properly reprocessing endoscopes, there can be between 50 to 100 complex steps to follow, which takes a significant amount of time. And endoscopes are particularly difficult to disinfect and they're easy to damage. This is due to their complex nature and narrow channels that are challenging to clean manually. Because of the types of body cavities they enter, endoscopes acquire high levels of microbial contamination during each use. For example, the bio burden found on flexible GI endoscopes after use range from 100,000 to 10 billion, with a B, colony forming units per ml, with the highest levels found in those suction channels. Human error is often cited for most of endoscope reprocessing failures. So to navigate HLD, we needed to identify its challenges, and there are many. The HLD process has multiple steps with multiple steps within each step. Manual versus automated HLD each have their own protocols, products, IFUs, and issues. HLD products, the disinfectants, enzymatic cleaners, detergents, and test strips each have their own product-specific instructions for use and a whole lot more. Then there's water and staff training and compliance and documentation and storage and device and facility design and solution disposal. So there are lots of moving parts and steps with HLD, plenty of opportunity to miss a step that could result in patient harm. With all of these challenges, why do we even use HLD? 
Those in favor of HLD emphasize its efficiency and practicality, especially in high throughput healthcare environments where sterilization isn't required. This is because, of course, the time required for HLD is typically less than that for sterilization. And this can be crucial in situations where quick turnaround times are essential. Now, this efficiency isn't only oper operational, it can lead to a substantial cost savings by reducing the need for single-use instruments or the need for additional inventory to accommodate longer sterilization cycles. Another reason in favor of HLD is that it can safely reprocess devices made from materials that are sensitive to the high temperatures and pressures of sterilization. Now, the arguments against HLD are backed by key players in the field, including the CDC and AMI, the Association for the Advancement of Medical Instrumentation. Sterilization methods like steam, ETO, ethylene oxide gas, and forms of vaporized hydrogen peroxide can eliminate all forms of microbial life, including those hardy bacterial spores. HLD, however, while we know it's effective against a broad spectrum of microorganisms, might not reliably eliminate all bacterial spores. Another compelling argument against HLD is the potential for human error. The effectiveness of HLD is highly dependent on strict adherence to complex, challenging protocols, including contact time and concentration, leaving room for variability and risk. The number of infections from semi-critical devices is partly due to the narrow margin of safety associated with reprocessing these devices by cleaning an HLD. Any deviation from recommended protocols can hinder high-level disinfection and leave a device contaminated with microorganisms. Research has shown there have been multi-drug resistant organism infection outbreaks related to flexible endoscopes, like those Olympus scopes we just talked about. Now to provide a higher level of insurance, evidence supports the sterilization of all flexible endoscopes, including those used in both semi-critical and critical procedures. The factors that support this transition include that high microbial load after patient procedures, the complex design of these scopes, and the risk for biofilm formation. Sterilization can reduce this risk because of the greater margin of safety that is in its overkill process, and it provides a really nice sterile packaged endoscope. Now, the AMI ST91 Standard Committee knows that transitioning from HLD to sterilization as the standard of care is going to take some time. Endoscope and sterilization manufacturers are going to need to design and implement the necessary device changes needed, and healthcare facilities will need time to budget and make some accommodations to implement this change. Now, the standard doesn't mandate sterilization, but it recommends healthcare facilities begin making the necessary steps towards sterilization for flexible endoscopes when possible. This change in processing of these scopes should be on your radar. So to navigate HLD successfully, I suggest we break it into manageable steps. We have to eat this HLD elephant one bite at a time. So let's start with IFUs. Confirm the HLD chosen is recommended in the medical device manufacturer's IFUs. And make sure those IFUs are available and being followed. Training and competency. Staff responsible for HLD must maintain the technical skills necessary to process devices that are safe for patient use. Competency should be performed on all the types of devices that staff member is authorized to reprocess upon hire, annually, and when something changes, and document this. Personal protective equipment. PPE is worn to protect the user. It must be worn during that point of use cleaning, decontamination, transport, and handling of chemical disinfectants. Clean and treat medical devices at point of use to make further reprocessing and decontamination easier. This is a critical step. Transport to the designated decontamination area for further reprocessing in appropriate bins, 
carts, and impermeable bags. This is an OSHA requirement. Decontaminate. Effective high-level disinfection begins with decontamination. This step involves thorough, meticulous cleaning using the approved enzymatic detergent for the IFUs and wearing all of the appropriate PPE. This is a critical step. If we don't get this right, disinfection can fail and patients can be harmed. Check the FDA website for cleared, approved high-level disinfectants and don't use unapproved products. High-level disinfection, that disinfectant is affected by many factors, organic matter, soap, lint, cotton sponges, and even the minerals found in water. They can all inactivate the HLD. Then there's evaporation, light, pH, time, and temperature that can affect the disinfectant. And detergents that enter the disinfectant solution can alter the solution's pH and reduce its effectiveness. So be sure and note the expiration, storage, or shelf life date. The Joint Commission has cited facilities for using expired high-level disinfectants. Pay attention to the reuse life. That's the time period the disinfectant solution can be used. And follow the manufacturer's time and temperature requirements, monitoring and documenting both. That HLD soak time and immersion you want to soak that device for the recommended contact time per the IFU. That disinfectant solution is only effective if it can contact all surfaces of a medical device. Completely immerse that device in that disinfectant solution per the IFU and make sure any instruments with lumens or channels are filled with the disinfectant. And once that soaking time starts, no other items can be added. Perform quality monitoring, and this applies to both manual and automated HLD. It applies to all the HLD products, the disinfectants, the detergents, and the test strips. This is one of those steps with more steps within it that are specific to the product and the IFUs. Be careful to pay attention to the details of each product for each device. This is where surveyors like to spend some time. So monitor that storage or shelf life, the chemical strip indicator testing, the use pattern, the reuse life, MEC monitoring, time and temperature, and that immersion soak time. Rinse the device with the indicated water per the IFUs under the surface of the water while agitating to minimize splashing. Dry your devices thoroughly to avoid dilution of HLD. Rinsing and drying remove residual disinfectants and prevent bacterial recontamination. Document. This is where you give yourself credit for all of that hard work you've done. Document device information, the type, its unique identifier, and the serial number. Disinfectant information, the type, the concentration, the expiration date, and the lot number of the disinfectant. Your process information, the date, the date and time of the HLD, the exposure time, and the temperature. Quality control, all the results of any quality, quality monitoring you've done. The method, was it manual or automated? Uh, testing, the results of the MRC, if you test for that, or the MEC. Solution concentration, the MEC of the test strip used to check the HLD. Personnel information, the name or initials of the person who performed the HLD, and patient information for traceability, the patient's name and medical record number if it's available. Documentation logs are important tools for infection preventionists, department heads, and risk and quality management, and they should be reviewed regularly to identify any gaps or omissions. Then we need to store our device in a separate room from patient care in what would be considered optimal conditions for use on the next patient. So that would be a low traffic, clean, dry, and dust-free place to protect them from damage and contamination. Then we'll dispose of that residual solution according to federal, state, and our local guidelines, regulations. Then considerations in facility design for HLD should include separation of decontamination from HLD if possible. Workflows should be unidirectional. 
Ventilation should be in a well-ventilated area to prevent exposure to vapors and include the correct amount of air exchanges. Negative air pressure in the reprocessing room and exhaust vented directly outside. After eating all of that, I am pretty full. So the list of challenges with HLD seems pretty long. Despite this, we still need to use this disinfection method until we figure out how to replace it or there comes a time when we just don't need it. I don't have any easy solutions to navigating the many HLD challenges we've identified. I will tell you, you're not alone in your anxiety performing this very complex disinfection method for semi-critical devices. Even small deviations from the process can lead to microorganisms surviving and an increased risk of infection. And no healthcare professional wants to be responsible for that. High-level disinfection requires as much diligence and attention to detail as sterilization. It's a complex process. HLD performed correctly can result in devices safe for patient use. A well-planned and managed quality monitoring program is a major part of ensuring the process is safe for patients. If you select the right product and implement an effective process, patients will be safer and your instruments and devices will continue to perform their best. Thank you.